everyone. I'm really happy to be here today, and I'm uh, Demetra Nightingale from the Department of Labor, and I know I have some um, other colleagues here from the Labor Department, and um, this is about the third or fourth uh, PIAC conference that I've uh, been able to attend, and I can tell you each one of them I've learned so much, and uh, we really appreciate all of the work that um, the PIAC team, AIR, our colleagues at the Department of uh, Education are doing because this is really a, um, a labor of love to keep um, the PIAC uh, going and uh, now to see some really uh, great analysis and research coming out. Um, I, I want to uh, also mention that uh, Secretary Perez, Tom Perez, Secretary of Labor, has really put a very high focus on a couple of things, one of which is improving employment opportunities for all workers by um, improving and upgrading um, skills and by focusing on improving the workplace uh, skills that are developed, both uh, literacy and uh, occupational skills. So certainly PIAC, as uh, Johan said, fits right into sort of the policy direction that the uh, federal government is going in right now. The second thing that uh, Secretary Perez has been doing is uh, traveling around the world uh, looking at uh, skills training programs, and uh, he's particularly interested in uh, workplace skills training. He just returned from a whirlwind tour of apprenticeship programs in, in uh, Europe and uh, is very excited about the direction that we're going in at the, in the U.S to adapt some of the workplace uh, skills and literacy development and work-related uh, training that is uh, happening. So again, PIAC uh, fits right into that uh, interest. Um, I think today he will be announcing a new availability of uh, $100 million in apprenticeship uh, grants that will be um, available. So take a look at the uh, at the grand announcement that will be coming out today. I think he's announcing it in Philadelphia. And, um, and my job at the Labor Department is to work it with every agency, uh, including the Employment and Training Administration, which some of the, my colleagues may be here, and the uh, International Labor Affairs uh, Bureau, and uh, to increase the accessibility of research and evaluation and to encourage the further um, completion and conduct of relevant research. So we're uh, excited about the PIAC research that we'll be talking about today, and we hope that there will be much more coming, and uh, the Labor Department is anxious to see all of the research that's coming out. The session today, this first session, is uh, on skills and workforce, which, again, uh, at the Labor Department, we, uh, that's, that's what we do is skills. And um, each of the uh, panelists will spend about uh, 15 to 17 minutes each, and then um, the discussant will also have that amount of time. Then we'll have plenty of time for um, discussion and questions from you, and then we will break into smaller uh, groups at each of the tables for a few minutes so you can get all of your, um, your adrenaline out um, <laughs> on the great ideas and, uh, that we're going to be hearing from our panelists. Um, I'm not going to do a long introduction of the panels because you have their uh, very impressive bios uh, in your folder. But I will just briefly say um, Bob Lorman from uh, American University and the Urban Institute, Professor of Economics, will be presenting the research that he's done with Harry Holzer, um, Professor of Public Policy at uh, Georgetown University. And then up screen, uh, joining us uh, with, the, uh, with technology from uh, Colorado. She is Professor of Economics at Colorado State University, and she'll be uh, with us, um, but not right here physically. And, uh, and then the third will be uh, Danielle Lindemann from the uh, Center for Women. She's a research director of the Center for Women and Work at Rutgers University. All of them will be uh, talking about either national or cross-national analysis that they have done related to skills and, um, and uh, using the uh, PIAC. And then our uh, distinguished uh, discussant, Evelyn Gansglass, um, 
well known to a lot of people here in this room and certainly in Washington for her expertise in the area of skills and workforce development literacy and, and uh, social policy over the years. Um, Evelyn is Senior Fellow at the Center for Law and Social Policy here, at, here in um, Washington. So I will turn it over to uh, Bob, keep him to 15 to 17 minutes, okay. and, uh, and then we'll try to stay on schedule for the conference. Well, thank you very much, Demetra, and uh, thanks to everyone. Thank you, Yohan, for your remarks and your hard work. Um, it's a pleasure to be here um, to lead off uh, to use these great data. Uh, we are only scratching the surface. Okay. Uh, we've only scratched the surface, but uh, we've tried to give a, a basic overview of the relationship between the cognitive skills measured in PIAC and uh, the earnings of the American workforce. So we'll get right to it. Uh, let me see here. So, um, just by way of introduction, we all know that uh, productivity is really central to our economic growth. Uh, and that skills basically add value to the worker um, and helps contribute to productivity. And we see that in all types of industries. Uh, people have remarked about how, for example, in the manufacturing world, uh, the level of skills required has increased dramatically, the level of cognitive skills. Uh, there were always important occupational skills uh, in that industry, but they're, they're around in all the industries. Um, if you misread something, you can make a big mistake in the health industry, uh, and that's not good. Uh, and that's a massive uh, jolt downward in our productivity. Now, labor economists have tended to use education and work experience as the usual proxies for skill. And in fact, the famous Becker human capital equation uh, looks at how the, the percentage changes in earnings are affected by uh, educational attainment uh, and work experience and even the square of work experience. Uh, but we all know that work experience and uh, education are kind of proxies for the real skills uh, that people use. And so one thing that PIAC does is allows us to go beyond the proxy and measure at least one dimension of skills, namely cognitive skills, uh, more directly and see the link uh, directly. So, uh, of course, uh, cognitive skills and even educational attainment are not the only skills that matter in the workforce, but we're going to focus on the contribution of cognitive skills. So we look at how PIAC measures of cognitive skills and remember even the PIAC measures we should think of as a proxy for cognitive skills because the PIAC measure is going to be measuring uh, cognitive skills with, with error. <clears throat> and how closely are these measures associated with earnings? Um, and do educational attainment uh, and occupation account for most of the earnings gains associated with these skills? In other words, do these skills uh, result from edu higher educational attainment, and that's what causes earnings? So, or uh, do they allow you to get the education, and that's what causes earnings? Are, or is there some independent role uh, of uh, PIAC cognitive skills itself? Um, we also look at uh, demographic and education and occupation groups and how they uh, uh, are related to PIAC skills and how that affects earnings. Um, and um, so that's the, the, the bottom question is the, the general question about uh, the implications for using educational attainment. So uh, we're going to be looking at uh, <coughs> what these uh, characteristics are. First, the uh, 
many of you have already read some of these basic uh, analyses of uh, the nature of the patterns of literacy, numeracy, and problem solving uh, are. Uh, and then we're going to look at how earnings vary, and then we're going to uh, look at how uh, these factors are influencing earnings in a multivariate analysis. So we're going to begin with some tabulations, and then we'll move to the multivariate analysis. Our sample uh, is all workers ages 25 to 65, and these are people who are actually in the labor force. Uh, who actually earned something, um, and we do not include here uh, the gains to literacy and numeracy and problem solving uh, in getting a job itself. So we are not looking at the impact on unemployment. We're looking at just among the 90 percent plus in the workforce who have jobs. Now it's about 95 percent of the workforce has jobs, 94.5 or something, 94.5% <laughs> uh, of the workforce uh, with jobs. Um, we, we look at how they uh, do in terms of proficiency and how that relates uh, to earnings. So this is uh, a, a graphical pattern um, where unfortunately, uh, the highest group, the highest share uh, of the workforce, of U.S. workers, employed people, um, shows the pattern of uh, their literacy, numeracy, and problem solving. Let me just go back and mention uh, that we, we look, our definition of low for numeracy and literacy is uh, two or one, uh, proficiency is three. Uh, and high is four and five. So even though four and five has two categories, it's by far the lowest. Um, and um, Bob, what are, the, uh, what are the columns there? I can't see the bottom. Oh, um, literacy, numeracy, and problem solving. Okay. The first one is literacy. Uh, That's a three. Um, I'm sorry? The brown. Uh, the brown is the three, yeah. Uh, the, the light brown is the three. The dark brown is the four and five. Uh, so um, we, we see a very disappointing picture here with uh, the, uh, in the case of numeracy, actually the majority uh, in the low category, in our low category, um, and in the literacy, uh, in a pretty low category. Um, so 50% being in the bottom two categories. Uh, next, I, we turn to um, worker subgroups. And um, one thing that we do see here are differences. Uh, they're not massive differences. This is the share of uh, workers in these various categories. Uh, and you see not much difference between uh, these groups. Um, the one, uh, group, one big difference is in numeracy uh, for males versus females, um, where females fall short in this particular case. Uh, these are just the percent in the low category. We see a massive difference, not surprisingly, uh, between the foreign born and the US born, uh, with foreign born very, you know, nearly three quarters, for example, in the lowest two categories in numeracy and in problem solving, um, almost as high in literacy. Um, and um, then another striking thing is the, uh, and this has been remarked upon, that uh, we're not seeing as much improvement. Uh, in fact, in some sense, uh, well, we're not seeing much improvement by age, in other words, you would expect younger groups to, uh, who are the more recent products of the educational system, to do better. They do a little bit better, uh, but not a whole lot better. Uh, that's the percent in the low category. These are the percents in the top two categories. Um, and again, uh, we see 
very similar differences. Uh, again, in numeracy, the difference, uh, even though uh, people who are younger have just been in school and should have been working on their math projects uh, fairly recently, um, they don't do much better than uh, us older groups uh, in, the, in the population. Um, if we turn to uh, the more, um, somewhat more interesting uh, set of numbers, um, we look at it by educational attainment. And what you see there uh, is uh, unexpected relationship. That is that uh, much, much higher rates of low levels of literacy at the lower levels of education. Um, and, uh, and, and then uh, we'll, see, uh, we'll see next uh, the higher proportions being in the very uh, uh, more advanced levels. Uh, and that goes up with education. However, um, it is quite disappointing uh, that even our BAs, um, only 24% uh, score in the top two categories in literacy uh, and 19% uh, in numeracy. I mean, that's pretty troubling, I'd say. Um, the other interesting thing is that there's a lot of overlap. Uh, these means don't really capture the overlap uh, among uh, educational groups. About 50% of those with only some college rank higher in literacy than 26% of BAs uh, who, are, who are not proficient. Um, and um, uh, those proficient among some college, uh, with some college rank higher, which is about uh, 26, you know, a small percentage, uh, rank higher than uh, half of the BAs. So there's a lot of overlap among these categories where some people with some college have much higher scores than uh, people even with BAs. Okay, so now let's turn to what's new in this analysis, and that is <coughs> the impact of, <coughs> excuse me, uh, these literacy and numeracy and problem solving skills on um, earnings. <coughs> excuse me. Uh, these are percent changes in earnings, and the first set um, looks at just the problem solving, thank you, the problem solving skills um, excuse me, the, the uh, literacy skills and numeracy skills, cognitive skills, I guess. The co impact of cognitive skills leaving out uh, educational attainment. So we're just saying, okay, what if we just look at all of them together? And what we see is that um, because they're run in the same equation, we can see that they all have a kind of independent impact. So it's kind of interesting that um, <clears throat> they're not so correlated that it's only one impact of one thing and then the rest dropping out. All of these seem to have uh, a, an independent impact. Uh, however, when we include education controls, um, the uh, literacy proficiency tends to drop out in terms of significance. Um, and what that's saying is that um, people with uh, different levels of education proxy the literacy skills pretty well, at least with respect to earnings, and at least with respect to the overall group. Uh, we're controlling here for sex, uh, foreign born, and age. Um, now we look at it by uh, gender, and again, what we see is a much bigger, yeah, okay, a much bigger impact uh, of numeracy skills than of uh, literacy skills. Um, and again, uh, the educational controls tend to wipe out uh, much of the literacy, but not for females. So for females uh, having high literacy skills, 
uh, accounts for a lot. By the way, these are monthly earnings, and the average is around 4,000. So uh, a jump to high literacy skill from low gives you a jump of almost 2,000, with a, when the mean is about 4,000. So it's a massive increase. <clears throat> For foreign-born, uh, these skills are extremely important, um, but it's mainly through, um, they, they, they don't, again, sustain uh, once we incorporate um, educational attainment. So there's a high, cl very close correlation between the um, cognitive skills and the educational attainment of the foreign-born, so much that it wipes out the separate effects. Um, but it doesn't wipe it out for the U.S. born. We see, again, uh, very high gains from numeracy proficiency. And then we look at uh, by educational status. And this is kind of interesting. We have kind of a U-shaped pattern here where um, these skills uh, provide some independent information about high school graduates. So these are people with high school or less. And you can see those that have high school or less, if they are proficient, uh, they can have uh, a much higher earnings. Um, and interestingly enough, for BAs. So <laughs> knowing that a person is a BA, has a BA doesn't really tell you as much about their numeracy skills as uh, you might think, um, at least with respect to the impact on earnings in the labor market. Um, the pattern by education, and the paper goes into more detail on this, uh, excuse me, by occupation uh, is shown here. Uh, these skills may help you get into a managerial or professional job, but even within those jobs, even once you have that job, uh, you can do much better uh, if your skills are high. Whereas in some of the other categories, um, uh, it doesn't help as much. Technicians, strikingly, it, it's kind of surprising. Think of technicians as maybe doing a fair amount of math. But um, once you get into that field, it's actually uh, literacy that plays the bigger role uh, in affecting your earnings. Um, craft workers, operators, assembly, uh, we can imagine that's kind of broad category, uh, and uh, we, uh, what we see here is that numeracy is extremely important. This is reflected in what I said earlier about uh, the growing skills required for manufacturing jobs. Yeah. One other technical point before I get to the conclusions, um, the uh, New, the cognitive skills and the educational <clears throat> variables uh, explain about one-third of the variation in earnings. <clears throat> now, that's a lot for these individual regressions. But on the other hand, it leaves a lot unexplained. So there's still a lot to do, as Johan mentioned, in terms of thinking about how these skills translate into potential occupational skills as well. So our conclusions are that proficiency matters, even after taking into account educational levels. That uh, it's numeracy that adds more, again, above and beyond the educational uh, results. Um, and uh, skill proficiencies affect uh, outcomes even for low and high education groups. Um, but there's much unexplained, as I mentioned. So just a couple of implications. I'll conclude with this. Um, as we all know, uh, this is an important uh, need. Uh, how we do it is uh, an open question, whether we do it with contextualized uh, training, which I prefer, where people are more motivated to learn, or whether we do it with a pure academic setting uh, remains an open question. But it seems to me that we do need to find, <clears throat> as Johan said, new ways of dealing with 
the issue because um, the results so far are disappointing. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, so much for uh, allowing me to present remotely here. I really appreciate the opportunity, um, and I'm following along all day today. Um, I'm going to be presenting some research here uh, about revisiting the effects of skills on economic inequality. I'm going to be looking both within and across countries um, using the PIAC data. Um, all right, so the the paper is really motivated here by the observation that skill levels and economic distributions, um, correlations have been noted between them in both formal academic literature and also in popular discussion. Um, that said, some of the previous literature that's out there from an academic perspective um, has found some mixed results um, in terms of kind of the magnitudes um, of any identified correlations and effects, for example. And uh, in my reading of the literature, this is really due to variation in empirical methods, but it's also due to limited availability of consistent skill data that's separate from education. Um, in the previous paper, um, Bob Lerman made the, the similar point that in the past people have used uh, education and sometimes experience as proxies for skill. And so we really have an opportunity here um, to use the PIAC data to actually try to do something um, a little more precise in terms of skill itself and also to look at an international context here given the number of countries involved um, where there are differences of course in terms of economic factors, of demand and supply and also in terms of less tangible factors in terms of differences in institutions and customs and culture, for example. Um, in terms of my research questions, um, I, I start by trying to think about the relative contributions to economic inequality, um, wage or earnings inequality here, um, for three different things. And so the first one is I want to think about contributions that have to do with levels of observable variables. So the things we see in PIAC in terms of levels of skills and education and experience and, and anything else, um, I then want to separate that from the parts of economic inequality that are due to labor market rates of returns. So the effects of those levels that we see in number one. Um, and then I'm going to separate those two from unobservable factors, unmodeled things, such as institutional differences um, that may be uh, in play behind the scenes. So I want to think about whether the new data is going to confirm previous findings or not. Um, and I'm also going to think about whether the, the new problem-solving skills are something that might be driving differences across previous results and the results I see here, or whether differences are due to a different time period, different data definitions, different scope of country coverage, et cetera. Um, so just to give you a quick, quick preview in terms of my findings, in a descriptive um, sense, um, there is, of course, evidence in PIAC of substantial economic inequality, um, also inequality in terms of skill measures um, across countries, across genders, um, et cetera. Um, in addition to that, uh, I, I can see that in terms of skill measures, there's more variability in the lower half of each country's skill distribution, but there's more variability in the upper halves of country-specific wage distributions. And so we'll be trying to think about that pattern um, as well. Um, in terms of the more formal modeling, I'm going to be using an econometric decomposition analysis to get at the three different components that I was just talking about. Um, and I'm going to be um, finding, basically, that unobservable characteristics are our primary driver, uh, much more so than the demand and supply factors um, that are being controlled for here um, via the, the observable characteristics. And the problem-solving measure is not substantially reducing the importance of unobservable factors, which has also been noted in the literature. Um, in terms of uh, gender, uh, Labor economics, for example, has split out gender um, as a, an important determinant of, of wages. And so I'm going to be thinking about that as well, uh, doing some results separately by genders. Um, the major result about unobservables, however, is unchanged um, across uh, 
those two subpopulations. The data is uh, from 23 OECD countries um, that are, are publicly available. So of course PIAC was done on 24. Um, Australia is the, the country um, for which the public use data is not available. Um, most of these countries, 22 of these countries are, are coming um, uh, from the internet national database and then uh, the Cyprus was merged in from the German data catalog. Um, that said, I'm starting with this aggregate data set, but because some of the countries don't have all of the data and, different, uh, and aren't perfectly comparable um, on some of the variables, um, there's further restrictions that we'll see as we go through. So lots of numbers here, but don't, don't worry about them. <laughs> um, what, what I basically want to uh, point out is uh, that we could think, of course, uh, about means, the, the midpoints of distributions for skills, for example, but that's not going to tell us too much about inequality. And so the three measures that I'm really going to be focusing in on our standard deviation, which is going to tell us something about the spread of the distribution. Um, and then I'm going to also look at percentile differentials. And for the percentile differentials, I'm going to be thinking about the difference between the median, the 50th percentile, and the, the 10th percentile. So 50 uh, hyphen 10 is the 50 10 percentile differential. And then I'm also going to be thinking about the upper half of the skill distribution in terms of the difference between someone who's at the 90th percentile versus the median. So I'm going to think of those three things as getting at um, inequality here in, in terms of skills. And the one thing that I'll point out um, specifically in this table is that we have a in terms of kind of the, the highest variability, at least at the upper end of the skill distributions, we see that for the English-speaking countries, for Canada, for the United States, and for the United Kingdom. And this is actually something that's been pointed out in some previous literature as well. And I want you to kind of hold that point because I'm going to come back to it and use it for something very specific um, in my model. Um, if I want to look at the wage data, in contrast to the previous paper, um, I, I primarily focused on uh, log hourly wages as opposed to monthly wages, but I do do some sensitivity checks um, at the end. But these are uh, 50, 10, and 90, 50 um, percentile differentials here. Um, so giving us an indication of kind of what inequality looks like in an economic sense at the low end of the distribution for the poorer people versus for richer people, people who are at the higher end of the distribution with those darker um, bars here. And we see a lot of variability of co cross country. We also see that there tends to be in a lot of countries um, more variability in the upper part of the distribution. We see that same pattern for men if we split this up as a, a, as a subgroup here, um, but it's much more dramatic for women, where in the upper half of, of the wage distribution, we're really seeing a lot of differences um, between somebody at the 90th percentile versus the, the 50th um, percentile. Um, okay, sorry, I lost, uh, <laughs> getting uh, hung up by the lag here. Um, there is, of course, some previous literature uh, that has looked at um, market returns, literacy, numeracy, and problem solving. Um, there's a paper by Hanyshek in 2013, um, and if I had known about the previous paper that was just presented, I would have added that here as well. Um, but these studies are basically looking at, at returns um, to skill. Um, and in terms of, of the Hanyshek paper here, Hanyshek and co-authors, they find statistically and economically significant relationships between skill and wage levels. Of course, I'm taking this in terms of looking at inequality. Um, so while this, this literature is definitely very interrelated, um, this is kind of an, a next step in terms of looking at inequality across countries. Um, there is some literature. Uh, on inequality across countries specifically, and I'll just point out two papers here, uh, De Roy and Freeman and then Blau and Kahn, um, they both used previous skill surveys, the International Adult Literacy Survey, um, for a, a number of countries. And they basically found fairly low correlations between skill inequality and, and earnings inequality, um, but they also found that unexplained portions of the models were, were really dominating skill levels as a major determinant. And so this is where I was entering with PIAC to see if the new problem solving measures, the, the, the greater extent of this, data, this survey in general, um, could explain more of the differences. Um, I'm going to be using the econometric decomposition methods to get at the three factors I mentioned before. 
And don't get hung up with these equations, but for those of you who have um, seen kind of econometric equations, the very basic intuition here um, comes from a paper, June et al. in 93, where uh, the authors start with a standard wage equation. Um, so think of Y as, as your wage variable and X as your skill levels, your education, and so forth. They think about rewriting the, the error term in terms of its conditional um, it's con uh, conditional cumulative distribution, and then they rewrite in, in terms of um, a baseline country B relative to a country J. And so that's the framework I'm going to be thinking about here, is measuring inequality relative to a base country, and then splitting up components in equations 4, 5, and 6, which actually add up to what we see in number three here for the observable factors, the observable returns, um, and the unobservable factors. In kind of the language of econometrics, the observable quantities is telling me something about what's the effect of the x, what's happening with the x's, versus the returns is telling me what's happening with the betas, and the unobserved factors is telling me what's happening in terms of the error term. For the baseline country, um, that point about the English-speaking countries being outliers in terms of skill inequality, um, that's coming into play here because I made the judgment call to try to use that as a base country to help with uh, context of interpretation. Um, the United States and Canada didn't have continuous wage um, distributions uh, in the public use data, at least the one I had access to, and so I, f I chose the UK um, as the baseline country in order to do, do the interpretations. There are lots and lots of tables like this in the actual paper, um, lots of versions for different subsamples and so forth. But the basic idea is in the first column here, the total difference between country J and the baseline. So the first number, for example, is between the Czech Republic um, and the base of the United Kingdom. What we're finding is that the Czech Republic has approximately 6%, because this was log wage, so um, we have this percentage interpretation here um, in an approximate sense, approximately 6% um, lower inequality in terms of the, the total difference here. Inequality is measured by the standard deviation of log wages, whereas a country like Estonia has about a 7% higher than the UK um, a standard deviation of, of log wages. Um, this is then being broken up into that observable quantities, the observable returns and the unobservables using those equations from the previous um, um, slide. And the big picture is that the really dominant factor is still the unobservable component. Um, the, the lower bound here is it's about 66, 67%, for example, um, of the total difference. Um, same kind of thing for the 50-10 log wage differential. Unobservables are still very dominant. Same kind of thing for the 90-50 log wage differential. Um, if we want to look at that upper half, the inequality of the, the richer groups, for example, we see the same pattern. Now, in those specifications that I just had up on, on the slide, um, I was just controlling for skills, the three different skill categories uh, that we've been thinking about today. Um, but I've also looked at... Um, including other uh, non-skill determinants um, in, into the regression as, of, as observable factors as well. So I controlled for age in terms of categorical age ranges, education experience, and experience squared um, in order to get at a, a non-linearity in experience. Um, and then what I find is actually very similar to the previous results. For the standard deviation of log earnings, 11 out of the 12 country pairs, we see a great greater importance of unobservable factors than anything else. For the 50-10 log wage differential, for 9 out of 12 cases, we see that pattern. For 90-50, we see um, 8 out of 12 cases, we see that pattern. Also see a similar pattern by gender. Also see a similar pattern by immigration status. Of course, the paper has details on all of these uh, other uh, robustness tests as well. I also looked at alternative education me measures to include non-formal education, for example, um, excluding the age variables. I primarily used the age variables because I was not making a restriction to prime age working um, uh, prime age workers here, I was actually uh, trying to use the larger sample size, and so I was controlling for age as a supplemental factor, but I excluded that. I also tried some different earnings measures, including the one used in the last paper, um, and didn't find any substantially different results. Um, a big picture caveat was that complete analysis of all the countries in PIAC was not possible here because of some data limitations. So while this data set definitely does have 
um, you know, much better background information and is more developed than other skill surveys and so forth. There were still some limitations. There were some countries not reporting problem solving skills. There were some countries not reporting continuous wage measures but reporting quintiles instead. There were some countries that didn't have things like gender or years of education. Um, and so for different runs of this I was able to use a different set um, of, of countries. So this definitely suggests that there would be use in the future um, to uh, pay even more attention to having comprehensive comparable data for international studies um, such as this one. The big picture conclu conclusion here was that unobservable factors um, were really key. Um, what are the unobservable factors? This might include institutional attributes that aren't controlled for here. It might also control, uh, include things like unobserved individual characteristics, such as non-cognitive skill, that perhaps is still not being picked up um, in the measures here. So definitely some things to be thinking about in terms of future work, um, adding um, institutional factors directly um, might provide some uh, value added here. Um, I got the five minute warning, <laughs> thank you, popping up on my screen. Um, in, in addition to that, um, some of the, the literature that's out there that I, that I reviewed um, identified some indicators that might pertain to some of these kind of institutional differences. Um, and that type of a framework could definitely be merged with this one, I think, in the future. Um, some very preliminary, preliminary examination that I did, um, looking at some institutional uh, factors such as union density and public sector employment, which were available from OECD across a number of the countries here. It looked like those were probably inversely related to earnings inequality, um, but I did not include them directly in the model. And so I really think of that as, as a potential um, next step that could uh, be useful here. Um, the paper suggests that there's limits in terms of education and training programs that are, that are relating to increasing skills. Um, there's limits in terms of reducing wage inequality at the same time. That doesn't mean that these programs don't increase skills, right? I think there's great evidence that, that programs do matter. Um, but for this kind of secondary purpose of also reducing wage inequality, it looks like there might be some limitations. At least that's what I found um, here in terms of uh, of this paper. Um, of course, understanding the particular institutions and how they matter is complex and a, a great starting point for additional research um, after this. Um, one disadvantage of the decomposition methodology is that it discounts supply and demand factors um, that, that uh, affect wages. And so there's some different methodologies out there, including more structural modeling of the demand side and the supply side of the market. Um, which might be used to compare and contrast what I've done here. Um, there's also some recent literature suggesting quantile regression methods, so some different, more sophisticated regression methods um, might be built into this for comparison into the future um, as well. And then there's other ways to think about economic risk and other ways to think about inequality in general. Um, I think it would be useful to examine race and ethnicity um, perhaps within the context of the U.S. where those types of indicators um, are available as opposed to in this international data set, um, or a more detailed examination of immigrants versus natives would be useful as well. Um, and then as more, more PF data releases um, come out as in, in the future, for example, if this is done again um, for these same countries, we could definitely look at some changes over time, which I think would be useful as well. So I want to begin by thanking um, Aaron and CES for having us here today and for supporting our work using this extraordinary new data set. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about some of my notable findings regarding gender differences in the use of numeracy skills at work and how this research plugs some gaps left by previous scholarship and how it also points us to fruitful avenues for further research using PIAC and beyond. So first, the research void. So previous scholarship has indicated that for a variety of reasons, women are less likely than men to enter into and to persist within so-called STEM disciplines and occupations, and that's science, technology, engineering, and math. And there's been a lot of research done about this. I've just included a few citations to just give you a little slice of it. Um, 
but there's been a wide swath of research on this topic, and this is really true across Western countries. So these gender imbalances in STEM are problematic for a variety of reasons. So first, studies have shown that occupational gender segregation is economically inefficient because it aggravates skill shortages and it inhibits the maximal performance of both genders by blocking their movement into professions that would best fit their personal skills and abilities. Secondly, it puts females at a double disadvantage when it comes to earnings. Women earn less than men across most occupations and female-dominated occupations pay less than historically male occupations, even after adjusting for skill level. Furthermore, STEM professions offer a substantial salary premium. Third, this sort of imbalance in STEM contributes to a human capital problem. That is, the supply of STEM graduates in most Western countries lags far behind employers' STEM talent needs. Um, so this previous work on women in STEM um, typically looks at occupational gender stratification at the level of either academic discipline or job type or in some cases mathematical proficiency. But I began by asking, what if female workers are using numeracy skills in their jobs to the same extent as men? They're just doing it in occupations that we don't typically think of as STEM. That is, stratification by job type might not be the same as stratification by actual skill usage. So in fact, we might imagine that quantitative tasks, such as performing calculations, taking measurements, and preparing charts and graphs, are involved in many occupations that are not, strictly speaking, STEM professions, including occupations such as nursing or secretarial work that have historically contained large proportions of women. So PIAC data are unique in this respect, in that they allow us to look for the first time at gender gaps in the actual use of numeracy at work, rather than using job as a proxy for numeracy work, and for numeracy use. So I look at a variety of things in this paper, but mainly I engage in two overarching analyses. So in the first section, I look cross-nationally at gender gaps in the use of numeracy skills at work, and I also look at the importance of a variety of covariates to these gaps. And then based on these analyses in the first section, I then wanted to know, well, then when women, when women are engaging in large amounts of numeracy at work, in what jobs are they doing it? So I generated kind of exploratory lists of these jobs. Now in the second section, because it was not feasible space-wise to generate these lists for all OECD countries, in the second section I focused specifically on the United States, First, because it's the national context in which much of the work surrounding women in STEM has been done, um, as well as being my own national affiliation. So I use a variety of variables in this paper, but the most important one for the purposes of this discussion today is the dependent variable, which is the use of numeracy at work. You may all know this already, but respondents were asked a series of questions about how often at their jobs they engaged in a variety of tasks, for instance, calculating prices, costs, or budgets. Responses were collected using a Likert scale. And then the variable that I use in this paper is the skill use inde index that was derived by PX study personnel based on IRT estimation procedures using these Likert items. And there's more information about the computation of this variable in the paper itself, um, as well as even broader information in the OECD Skills Outlook document. So, and what I found was that first, in accordance with previous literature concerning gender disparities in STEM participation, I do find that males measure significantly higher than women on the index of numeracy skill use at work, and that this is true across most OECD countries. However, I say most because this was not the case within every context, nor was it the case for every kind of demographic subslice of the population. So in this table here, the regions with gray shading are regions in which the male mean for numeracy use is not significantly higher than the female mean. So you might be able to see, but it includes the Czech Republic, Italy, Poland, and the Slovak Republic. Again, these are regions in which the male mean for numeracy use is not significantly higher than the female mean. In, other, in all other regions, however, the gender gap was quite significant. Further, we don't 
don't see men exhibiting significantly more numeracy use at work, as I mentioned, within every kind of subgroup of the population. For instance, if we look cross-nationally at the populations of those countries below age 25, or at least the employed population, we see men are performing significantly more numeracy in their jobs than women only in a few jurisdictions. And these include France, Germany, the Netherlands, and the US, um, and Italy, I don't know if you can see, but is excluded here. Um, it didn't meet reporting standards for this item. But even in these four countries where men are still significantly outscoring men in terms of numeracy use, the gaps are substantially smaller than in the overall population of workers. So again, these are all people under the age of 25. So women are generally using less numeracy in their jobs than men, but there are some national exceptions, and this is also not true within every subslice of the population, as this table demonstrates. So then I turn to when women do use numeracy in their jobs, in what jobs are they doing it? So I turned my attention to the US public use file then. And among other things, I looked at the 10 most common occupations for individuals measuring in the highest quintile of numeracy skill use by gender. These are people who are performing a lot of numeracy in their jobs. And what this chart gives you a little sense of, if you can read it, and there's obviously more detailed analysis in the paper itself, is that men and women who perform large amounts of numeric, ta numeric tasks at their jobs are employed in some of the same job categories, um, such as sales. However, high numeracy skill use at work is also stratified in ways that align with historical patterns of occupational gender segregation in the United States. So women in the top quintile for numeracy use, who use a lot of numeracy at their jobs, tend to cluster within historically so-called female fields, such as secretarial work and nursing, while top quintile men are more likely to be in, for instance, construction or engineering. And this remains true even when we control for things like age or highest degree received. And these analyses were presented in the paper, but due to time constraints, I'm not going to present them here today. But top quintile women cluster within careers such as nursing and early childhood education, while men who use large amounts of numeracy in their jobs are more likely to be working in, for instance, mining, manufacturing and construction, working as engineers, computer software development, information technology, or working as mechanics. So just to summarize the findings, first, I did find that occupational gender segre segregation involves stratification at the skill level as well as in the category of job as has been found by prior studies. However, these mean differences in numeracy skill use are not, significantly, are not statistically significant within each OECD country, nor within every demographic subgroup of the population. Now turning to the United States, men and women who perform large amounts of numeracy skill use in their occupations are employed within many of the same job categories, such as sales. However, numeracy skill use at work is also stratified in ways that align with historical patterns of occupational gender segregation. Now, it's important to point out a few limitations of these analyses. First, these lists of the top occupations for men and women who perform large amounts of numeracy in their jobs are based on relatively small sample sizes and should be viewed as exploratory lists and kind of catalysts for future research. Not necessarily in the chart that I showed you today, <laughs> um, but when we do begin to break it down and control for additional things like age and education level. However, with the release of the PS, PIAC US National Supplement, we will be able to repeat some of these analyses with larger sample sizes. Secondly, the numeracy scale takes into account both basic and advanced skills. So my analysis does not assess in particular whether women or men are more likely to be dealing with high-level mathematical concepts or performing advanced calculations. Third, the tasks evaluated by the numeracy scale don't align exactly with the types of skills required across all STEM occupations. So one might imagine a biologist or a psychologist, for instance, engaging in a task such as performing an experiment or evaluating a patient that is scientific but not necessarily quantitative in nature. However, I argue
argue that both of these limitations, these last two, are also strengths in that PX numeracy index enables a very specific and unique contri contribution at the level of skill itself to the, to the literature on gender, math, and work. And that brings us to the implications of this work. First, thinking about STEM in terms of high-level occupations, such as physicist or engineer, as has been done by much of the work in the past, rather than in terms of discrete skills that can be basic or advanced, eclipses much of the numeracy skill usage that takes place across a spectrum of occupational categories. In fact, the context where the most workers in the U.S. engage in these large amounts of numeracy, these top quintile folks, are not all occupations requiring advanced or even undergraduate degrees. There are a lot of so-called blue-collar blue occupations in there, too. These results also suggest that the notion that women are being filtered out of quantitatively oriented careers is not completely accurate. Looking at the level of discrete numeric skills allows us to see that women are engaging in numeracy skill use. In fact, in some countries and within some demographic groups, they're doing this at rates comparable to men. Somewhat paradoxically, looking at the United States, women use large amounts of numeracy relatively often in so-called pink-collar occupations, such as nursing and secretarial work that have historically been female-dominated. So while much scholarship has focused, and importantly, on women's underrepresentation in these high-level, white-collar STEM careers, future research should turn greater attention to occupations that entail quantitative skills but don't necessarily fall under this typical umbrella of what we might consider to be STEM. Some policy changes to ameliorate gender segregation within these occupations might include career and technical education programs for students, educational institutions, employers, and employees. Such programs might be designed in order to enable men and women both to view the transferability of their skills to non-gender traditional occupations, but to also galvanize employers to identify their needs for greater gender parity and to actively recruit and retain employees across gender lines. Um, another result that calls for additional scholarship is the finding that within some OECD countries, there aren't significant gender disparities in numeracy skill use at work, while others have significant gaps only within particular age cohorts. Future research might focus on these countries, their particular economies, their educational systems, and their job market structures in order to unravel these jurisdictional differences. So in particular, these findings point to myriad ways in which PIAC data might be used in the future to respond to research questions about gender and work. Future iterations of PIAC will enable us to perform these analyses longitudinally in order to assess, for instance, whether an age or cohort explanation is responsible for the diminished gender gaps in numeracy skill use among the youngest respondents. Furthermore, with very few exceptions, very little research has actually analyzed the careers chosen by women who leave the so-called STEM pipeline. That is, they major in STEM in college, they don't go on to STEM careers. These escape routes and their appeal to women are crucial for future research and policy surrounding gender imbalances in STEM. And this is a topic that could also be explored using PIAC's survey of adult skills. Now finally, there's much exciting work to be done looking at gender gaps in numeric proficiency and the connection between that and the use of numeracy, both at work and at home. It'll be important to travel down these multiple avenues of future research in order to better understand not only female underrepresentation in math, the sciences, and technology, but occupational gender segregation more broadly and the ways in which stakeholders at the international, national, and local levels can really best harness and deploy the skills needed for work in the 21st century. Just a couple of, of acknowledgments. I'd like to thank AIR and CES. I'd also like to thank Dana Britton and the Center for Women in Work, um, where I'm currently employed. And I look forward to hearing all of your comments.
Um, hi. Uh, let me say I am not a researcher. I am a policy wonk type from Washington, just across the way. So just as beginning, I hope I haven't oversimplified some of these complex things that people have been talking about. <laughs> uh, but in my simple way, I'm trying to make some sense about what is it that we're going to do with some of this information. And, and also, just to say at the very beginning, as a policy advocate for on behalf of low-income people, um, I fully agree with Dr. Pena's point that skills aren't the only determinants of economic inequality and that education policy itself isn't going to solve inequality problems in this country. Class and other advocates work on multiple fronts, but education policy, skills policy, is one of the few areas that this very fractured city seems to be able to reach some agreement on. And so therefore, there's a lot of opportunity to do some, some important work in this area. And also to just say, again, from an individual point of view, looking at, at poor people, at some level, the relationship between knowledge, skills, and abilities, and I'm going to use those words more than um, the PIAC terms and credentials and earnings is really quite simple. On average, the more education you have, the higher skills you have, the higher credentials you, you have, the better you do on virtually all economic and social indicators. So from an individual and family point of view, it makes sense to invest in, in education, and we have to do a lot better than, than we're doing. Uh, let me start with a few comments about the relationship um, um, between the connection between skills, those covered by PIAC and the broader knowledge, skills, and abilities terms, and credentials. And reassuringly, both Bob and Harry, Holzer and, Her and Lerman, find that there really is a correlation between uh, proficiency, numeracy, literacy, problem solving, and le level of education, although there's a lot of variation within each of those categories. Um, there has been a proliferation of credentials in the United States, educational credentials of all kinds, certificates, um, more specialized degrees. There's been a proliferation of, of industry certifications, of badges, and all kinds of ways trying to certify what people actually know and be able to do. And there's a lot of confusion in that, in that credential marking marketplace. A recent study by Burning Glass um, that looked at the increasing education requirements in the, in the U.S. labor market um, found that employers are using the bachelor's degree as a proxy for knowledge, skills, and abilities that they're looking for in, in employees. Not because they actually know what a bachelor's degree represents, um, but because they're not happy with what they're getting and it's kind of a safe bet that more is better and therefore let's go with um, a bachelor's degree. And so because they really don't know and because there are legal issues as well as they think about using skills and other indicators for hiring, uh, they turn to educational credentials. Once employed, once people are hired, obviously knowledge, skills, abilities, um, are much more obvious as people are performing in the workplace and, and presumably can be rewarded as well. This variation in proficiency uh, within education levels that uh, Bob and Harry um, identified is consistent with what CLASP and a, a partner organization, the Corporation for a Skilled Workforce, found in the process of developing a competency-based credentialing framework for the U.S. The draft credentials framework has eight levels of knowledge, cognitive and technical skills and personal and social abilities. Um, and we broke out the abilities into the personal and social abilities because employers keep emphasizing the importance of these, quote, soft skills, employability skills. Although the credentials framework uh, resembles the, the qualifications frameworks of, of other countries, it, it is not designed to level credentials, as does the UNESCO uh, classification scheme for professional education. Rather, it, it's, it's a framework to try to provide clarity for comparing and contrasting 
the actual skills implicit in different kinds of credentials, all kinds of credentials, not just educational ones. And as part of developing this, we asked um, groups, education folks, community colleges that issue certificates that award certificates, as well as professional certification organizations that issue certifications, and others in, in a variety of industries and occupations, uh, to use this framework um, to, uh, to really test it for our purposes. But what was really interesting when we, when we asked them to do that is we found two things. That there's considerable variation in the level of knowledge, skills, and abilities implicit within the levels of the different kinds of credentials. So within a bachelor's degree, you might have a wide range of expectations depending on the field of study. Um, and there was also a different profile. There were different profiles, mixes of knowledge, skills, and abilities within these different kinds of credentials. So they weren't all even. So somebody with an associate degree might have, depending on the occupation and the field of the study, uh, may have a higher expectation or requirement in the numeracy area than in the literacy area or in problem solving. So these patterns, um, it, we, we need to look at it a lot more closely. This is a preliminary research, but um, things aren't all even, and it's not just this um, variation in people's abilities, but in, in the jobs themselves as we assume that the, the cr um, credentials reflect some of those job requirements. The point is no wonder employers and um, individual students, workers, are totally confused by what cr credentials represent. One clear implication for us, uh, both for policy and practice, is that we have to move beyond the time-based, credit-based um, credentialing and, and learning system to one that is much more competency-based so that there's greater transparency and, and greater flexibility um, in, in these systems. Holzer and, and Lerman uh, discussed the returns to literacy and numeracy independent of educational attainment, and Bob talked about that within broad occupational groups by gender, age, foreign-born status. Um, just to point out for the U.S. context, although race is not included in these papers, we know that the rate of low literacy among black adults is twice as high as that for, adult, for all adults, contributing to and a consequence of um, the vicious cycle of, of inequality and intergenerational poverty. So there's a lot more that needs to be done in, in looking at, at race. In part, these differences reflect uh, different um, requirements of jobs, as, this, as the, Dr. Pena points out, and other things such as regulatory environment, differences in supply and demand, and density of unionization, all affect wages in these, in these occupational areas, and therefore the return on investment calculations. These, affected, these um, differences also affect um, um, the value of, of different credentials, uh, in different fields of study, as, as Tony Carnevale has written um, extensively about it, especially at the uh, certificate level. Uh, Lindemann makes the case that these differences, in fact, also reflect um, gender and age segregation of jobs. And just as one example of that is um, Bob and Harry provide data on earnings gains from increased numeracy um, uh, proficiency are generally higher, uh, generally higher than for literacy, and that men benefit more from increased numeracy and women more from increased lit um, literacy. Uh, Lindemann explains some of these differences by pointing out that the top high numeracy jobs include engineering and software development dominated by men, and some of the uh, literacy rich uh, female occupations are much lower paid than than those for men. An area perhaps of further research, um, Harry and Bob point out that, um, that they find that a U-shaped effect with greatest impact of increased proficiency among the highest and the lowest earners. They find that workers with some college see no significant earnings increase within higher levels of cognitive skills. My guess is that there is so much noise within that bucket of some college um, not the least of which the wide variation in return from sub-associate 
uh, level credentials, but this may be an area of, of further research. One of the clear implications for policy and practice from all of this, these confusing um, relationships um, is that we need to do a better job with career guidance and with academic advising um, and help people understand what the actual skill requirements are of different uh, fields of, of work and different fields of studies. Um, career pathway strategies can create on-ramps to further education training for low-skilled people and manageable steps along a pathway to help people access good jobs. Career pathway maps, such as those produced by all of the community colleges in Oregon, are really very useful tools for this kind of career guidance thing, um, that I'm talking about. A few other um, implications. As widespread as numeracy and literacy and problem solving problems are, uh, within this country, we need to pursue more integrated <coughs> approaches to workforce development, and um, Johan spoke about that earlier today. The OECD study, <coughs> Skills Beyond School, recommends this and highlights the importance of more effective um, assessments. Um, Johan again talked about this, but just a few points about the Workforce Investment and Innovation Act requires that, that this new law that was just recently passed, one of the few that were passed in Washington in, in the last several months, um, requires unified planning between workforce development, adult education, and vocational rehabilitation programs, and provides an extraordinary opportunity for unified planning with TANF, with welfare programs, as well as with their supplement, with SNAP, the food stamps program which focus effectively on achieving self-sufficiency for uh, very low skill populations. We are also promote some level of shared accountability um, for educational and labor market outcomes to encourage implementation of more integrated approaches. These approaches include contextualized learning, such as the IBEST model that many of you know about that integrate basic skills English language instruction and vocational instruction, and career pathways approaches um, that incorporate such models and provide on-ramps, as I said, for low-skill individuals to further training and employment. I want to note that the um, omnibus um, appropriations bill that is, has it passed, or is, is hanging out there somewhere um, by midnight to be passed, perhaps. Um, has reinstituted the ability to benefit provisions for career pathway participants um, in a limited way, but that's a major um, step forward from having gone backwards or step forward. Um, in addition, uh, WIOA um, uh, promotes work-based learning strategies, which has a potential for incorporating many of the best practices that we've learned for, from workplace literacy, which has been uh, pretty neglected of late. These approaches all are hopefully will, um, will be incorporated and built on in new um, policies that are being made at the Department of Agriculture for the SNAP program with increased attention to uh, um, the SNAP employment and training programs. And I would say the SNAP um, experiments, that, again, that Johan mentioned, provide an opportunity for further research on effective practices in serving those with very low skills. A couple of other points that I want to make, and I'm getting close to the end. WIA expands eligibility for adult education from those lacking um, high, school, a high school to diploma to a broader group of people who are, and I'm quoting, unable to compute or solve problems or read, write, or speak English at a level necessary to function on the job in individuals, family, or in society. Those words will seem familiar to many of you. It also requires that under Title I, which is the, the workforce program's priority for accessing training in high-intensity career services um, be given to those with basic skills deficiencies or other barriers to employment. It requires that 75% of the funds for youth be spent on services for out-of-school youth who consistently exhibit very low levels of proficiency in, in um, cognitive skills. Even prior to the passage of WIOA, 
growing number of states have moved the administration of their adult education programs into their workforce agencies. The greater, of integ the greater integration of workforce and adult education is definitely a good thing, but there's a danger that because of a great need, um, because of great need and very limited resources, that um, those with very low skills are going to be served less and that um, interventions that are, you know, low, low touch interventions um, may be used more effectively to spread, the, not more effectively, may be used more extensively to, to spread the money among more people. Um, this, is a, this is a real concern because at least at this point we, we haven't seen a lot of success with these kinds of strategies. Two other points, and I know I'm running out of town, time. President's executive order uh, providing work um, authorization and social security numbers for some five million currently undocumented immigrants provides both an opportunity and a challenge for both uh, the workforce and the adult education systems. Um, the Title I, Title II collaboration to serve this population has been a problem in the past because of documentation requirements in the workforce programs and presumably that's not going to be the problem. Uh, we have models, both systems lack the resources to really to expand to address this, um, this new population in, in a very uh, big way. Clearly there is enough, not enough money um, in any of these systems. I don't expect Congress um, to um, come up with a lot more money, although it, it's um, gratifying that there was a little increase in adult education, at least not a cut this year, um, and hopefully states will uh, step up to the plate and, and increase some funding uh, for these programs as the tax revenues start coming in. Um, there's always the hope that employers will change their practices and increase investments, but the trends have been very much um, going in another direction. Two minutes, one more paragraph. Finally, um, uh, okay. <laughs> finally, beyond the uh, scope of this panel, um, the findings also suggest a desperate need for continued reform in K through 12 education and developmental education reform in higher education. In some community colleges, as many as 70% of students must take at least one uh, remedial course before moving on to their, uh, pro in their program of study. However, it's important to try to avoid some unintended consequences in, in that regard. For example, in some states, uh, developmental education reform has resulted in, an, in a large shift, a significant shift of people out of developmental education into the adult education system because they're trying to reduce the numbers in uh, developmental ed. So again, a shift to a program that is so vastly underfunded and really lacks the capacity to do all of that work. So I hope I've um, touched on enough controversial issues to um, <laughs> stimulate a discussion in the small groups. Thanks. Um, thank you. These were um, terrific, and I'm sure that many of you have comments, questions, reactions, thoughts, and uh, the, uh, the schedule for the day and tomorrow has been set up so that we have plenty of time for discussion. So I'm happy to take questions. I ask that you, uh, there must be mics that will come, uh, come around and I think uh, Professor Pena is also on with us and um, uh, please give your name and affiliation when you, uh, and if you raise your hands, the mics will come to you, I think. Um, I think it's uh, it's interesting to know, did you have something? Oh, okay. <coughs> I think it's interesting to note that all three of the um, papers raise interesting and important observa um, information about the importance of um, other variables and other data items. Uh, those of us who are researchers always want more. We want more in the in PIAC and we want more research and more money to do to do all of that. Um, but some of the uh, <coughs> institutional uh, variables and some of the unobservables, such as the uh, non-cognitive, all, all three um, raised uh, comments about that. 
and the importance of looking, uh, as we're doing research and continuing to doing research, looking at the intricate relationships and uh, explanations for variations um, across a lot of things, whether it's occupations or countries or gender or um, within education and the difference between um, literacy and numeracy and what that means for sort of the workforce issues. So I turn it over to all of you. Okay, right here. Thank you. Uh, I'm Gail Spangenberg, Council for Advancement of Adult Literacy. Um, two of the papers seem to be at odds on a fundamental issue and I sort of have a question, wonder if you could sort of talk about it a little. One says more literacy will increase wages for certain groups earning capacity. And the other one says the opposite, it may not, and either earning capacity or reduce inequality. And I wonder if you could just sort of comment on that specific issue, literacy and how and whether it will. Uh, I think I, all three of them may have something to say. I'm not sure that um, there is a particular conflict. Uh, the, uh, what, what we found largely was that, that, that they do matter. I think they matter probably uh, internationally as well, but they may not explain as much of the inequality as uh, we might have expected. But that, those are two different indicators. One is the impact on in <coughs> individual earnings and the other is the impact on inequality. Now, there is some, I mean, you have somewhat of a point. If, if, it's, if that was all that mattered, then you would expect highly variable uh, uh, gaps in um, skills to lead to highly variable uh, gaps in earnings. Um, uh, I haven't studied the other papers, so uh, I, I, I think that that may still be true. It's just that uh, the amount of inequality uh, related to other things is quite important. And, and even we said that um, even when you include um, the cognitive skills and the educational levels, uh, it only accounts for about a third of the variability. So in that sense, there's some uh, commonality. I don't know whether you want Yes, to. Anita, can you? Um, yeah, I, I'd like to, to add to that as well. I agree that um, it, it's actually two separate issues. Um, and in my research, I mean, I have these first kind of stage um, research um, methods where I'm looking at, at the wage equations. Um, actually in a way that's similar to the first paper, and I am finding that there's a return on skill that's consistent with the other paper and some other things in the literature as well. Um, but recall that that's what's holding for the average worker, whereas for inequality, I'm actually studying the spread. So I'm thinking about the standard deviation around that mean, and I'm thinking about inequality for poorer people and for richer people with those percentiles and differentials. Um, as well. So I don't think there's an inconsistency here because the mean could be moving, whereas the spread around the mean is actually not significantly moving. And I think that's kind of a, a summary of, of what the dynamic is um, behind the scenes here, if uh, that makes sense. Could, could I just ask a clarifying question here? Absolutely. Um, so, are, you know, you, you mentioned that uh, a large part of the variability across countries in earnings inequality is due to sort of unexplained uh, yeah. factors. But uh, you didn't go into, uh, even if it's a small portion of the variability in earnings inequality, whether these skill differences account for any. Um, so that they do account for some, but I, I noted that you know the lower bound for, for um, the unobservable was a contribution of about 66%. Oh. That was the, the, the low side. I think the average was right around 89% across the countries um, that I studied. And so that leaves 11% left over uh, of the variability that's explained by observable factors, including skills and the returns to skills. And so and it, it's a minor contribution in comparison to this larger unobserved um, category. That said, the unobserved category, um, to the extent that, for example, different types of 
Um, Danielle, if you could say something, because some of it could also be um, gender wage uh, differences by occupation. Sure. Um, so, I mean, I didn't really look at um, wage differences in my paper per se, but certainly there's been a large body of research um, focusing on the relationship between proficiency and um, gender stratification by occupation. Um, and what a lot of that, that research has found is that even net of proficiency, there still is going to be stratification by gender and occupation. So if you take a woman and a man who scored the same in the math SATs, the man is still much more likely to go into a kind of numeracy-rich job or kind of STEM occupation, as we would say. So there are certainly cultural factors driving that as well. We definitely can't discount the importance of culture, right? So we can control for all sorts of structural factors, but it's much harder to control for, for the influence of culture. And I, think, I feel like that's always important to point out, that we, we, you know, we don't exist in a structural vacuum. There are also you know, cultural factors as well dragging us in different directions. One of the things that will help those of us who do research in the US is to use PIAC to um, try to disentangle a little bit some uh, information from countries where you don't see the same kind of, um, of disparities and uh, patterns that we might see if we're looking at all of the countries together. So uh, PIAC is certainly a, a welcome tool for us to use. This. Um, Scott Murray, I run a consulting company in Canada and I've been down this road and wanted to share some of the anguish. <laughs> Uh, what we've learned I'm is... I'm not sure which road he's talking about. Well, <laughs> trying to explain both productivity and inequality and wage differentials. And what we know from what we've done is you need to control for the demand of the actual occupation at a very detailed level. That's the first thing. And that gets you partway to solving some of the, the issues. But what we know now is that employers differ greatly even using the same occupations in their behavior. Some create good jobs, some create bad, and it isn't until you get those measures of whether they're creating dumb jobs and competing on price or creating skill-rich jobs that you actually get down to the bottom of this. And so we're seeing in those dumb job ones massive skill loss uh, using longitudinal data that is even more troubling than the relationships you're looking at. And so one of the things we've done in Canada, we actually ran a very elaborate and extraordinarily expensive randomized control trial, working in the bottom end of the skill and wage distribution, measuring the impact of skill gain on productivity and outcomes at the firm and individual level. And magically, from that gold-plated study, you get 125% annual rates of return on investment. And there can be no argument about causality uh, in such a such a study. So the effects are real. To, but to the worker or to the for To both. You yeah. mean the combined? Well, and we were able to estimate them independently because it was a two-level randomized controlled trial. Firms randomized and then workers within firms randomized. And so there's a, a little bit of contamination effect at the, inside the firms. Um, but, but the effects are real and, and much more defensible than looking at aggregates. Right. And just one other small thing, the, um, the skill use measures you use, Danielle, mm -hmm. they're available in 94 and 2003, exactly the same, so you can do a trend analysis on how women's use of, uh, of numeracy has changed over time. Thanks. Great. Great. Other, other yeah. uh, comments, reactions? Yes. Yeah. Hi. Uh, this is Mary Alice McCarthy from New America. And I sort of want to build on a point that Evelyn brought up and that Demetra, you just brought up, which is somebody who focuses on policy and policy development, this idea that over 60% of the variability or over 60% of inequality is explained by unobservables is kind of terrifying because it's sort of like what is out there and how do you think about policy when so much is being affected by things that are unobservable. So I wanted to ask the panelists, and particularly um, Anita, um, a question sort of in terms of if, if our goal from a policy standpoint is that we want there to be a return on skills. In a meritocratic society like our own, we want skills to pay. And we have a lot of policies that are organized around that basic precept. Understanding what is interfering with making skills pay is very important for policy. Thinking about these unobservables and in particularly these institutional factors, and here I presume we're thinking about labor market institutions, I just wonder if the panelists could sort of walk us through a little bit 
is it possible to know, you know, is it possible to make these unobservables observable? What's, what's knowable here? What does it look like to make them knowable? How do cross-national comparisons help us identify those and start, and start being able to talk about them as things that interfere with the relationship between skills and... And, and we can uh, make better policy. Yes, Anita, exactly. <laughs> reaction to that? Um, so the first thing, I, I think maybe there's a misconception about what I was saying uh, in the paper. I was not saying that, that skill does not pay. I was saying that you know, for an individual um, who has skill, there, there would be a return to that skill. It's just not something that's greatly affecting the, the distribution of pay um, in a, a more aggregate sense. But in terms of some of these uh, unobservables, um, so the Hanishek paper that I was citing um, pulled some data from the OECD data portal um, where, where presumably these indicators are, are uh, comparable, at least to some extent, across countries. And they pulled things like union density and public sector employment. And then they had um, some a protection index for workers and, and things that have to do with minimum wage legislation and product market. And so those are the, the particular types of policies that I think in kind of a next step, it would be useful and there would be value added to including those um, directly into a model, um, controlling from them precisely to try to see um, if, if any of those are the particular drivers right. um, of the unobservable component. Other uh, yeah. Um, I mean, I thought that the 33% was pretty good, actually. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, especially given the uh, number of variables uh, that we don't have in there, uh, region, city size, and so on. But more fundamentally, um, as uh, has been mentioned, um, you know, wages are really an interaction of supply and demand. And uh, as our friend from Canada po points out, uh, the nature of the demand structure is very relevant uh, to uh, the wage wages and the wage returns um, and the level of capital for example uh, the level of technological change uh, we wouldn't expect um, you know these competency measures to uh, explain everything um, and uh, as we said before cogn cognitive skills and occupational skills are really quite important um, so there's a whole variety of things. I mean, there's even things like, uh, uh, is the job very difficult? Is it, uh, you know, is uh, you know, is it dangerous? So th there are a whole number of things that we would expect uh, above and beyond uh, the gain from skills. Uh, I would say one thing I, I meant to say during my talk. Um, you know, we sometimes in the United States say, you know. We have the best trained workforce, or politicians sometimes say that. <laughs> and they say, uh, you know, how much we deserve these higher wages. I mean, you look at these numbers, and, and it's not clear that we do. I mean, it, in a way, it's a wonder we do as, it's a way, in a way, it's a wonder we do as well as we do. Given, given the level of skills, um, oh we, we have, <laughs> well, I'm not running for office. <laughs> And I'm not saying the American public is stupid. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> uh, but uh, but it, is, it is somewhat a wonder that we do as well as we do, uh, given, given the lower, lower skill levels. And it does show that we have uh, some other things that are offsetting that, uh, that uh, allow us to pay pretty good wages. Now, it's, we also have high inequality. But in any event, I, I think it's, uh, it's a troubling thing that we haven't, and, and the fact that we haven't really made much progress, I it's, want Danielle to enter it's, it's, it's quite troubling. And, uh, any any uh, variables, Danielle, that you'd like to see us add in? Well, I still might run for office, so yeah. I might want to be. There you go. But, um, <laughs> No, I mean, I was going to say, I'm not, an, I'm not an economist, but I know that in the United States, our economy, and um, I've learned from working with economists that, um, that there is an, uh, an 
accommodation and adaptation to the skills of the workforce right. that leads to the high productivity that we have in the U.S. And if we can up the, um, the skills overall, it will right. allow for more productive um, results. results. Um, well, I Especially mean, if we have equality by gender. <laughs> I, I guess my roots as a cultural sociologist are showing a little bit here because I do want to add because culture, culture right? Important. I mean, there, the great thing about a data set like PIAC is that it provides us sort of the catalyst for a variety of other types of studies, including qualitative work about the importance of factors like soft skills, about disparities in confidence, disparities in the social networks that people have, which more and more we're finding is increasingly important. And these are things that we can get at maybe not using this nationally representative large-scale survey, but using more qualitative studies like yeah. interviewing and focus groups and that sort of thing. So just to answer your question, just because those things are unobservable to us right now, it doesn't mean they'll forever remain this black box, right? We can, we can bring them into focus at some point. So if I could just tie those three comments together a little bit, there are some, that, there are some of those um, variables that uh, Anita mentioned that, that we can uh, link in with the PIAC, um, sometimes um, going to other databases, and maybe in the future PIAC might have them integrated there as well. And, um, and the research that's being done from all three of these papers will help us to identify the types of unobservables that we may need additional exploratory research on that eventually we can uh, move into the quantification. Evelyn. Yeah, I, didn't, I didn't say it, but there are there are squabbles within the policy community that are totally unproductive between the education, skill, human capital type folks and people who are dealing with minimum wage, unionization, other factors. Um, and we have to be careful with, with the papers that come out and the messaging that it's not one or the other. And that's what I tried to say at, at the very beginning, because each side will say, well, see, it's only 30%, and two-thirds is this, or the other way around. I mean, you can't solve all of these problems with one policy strategy. And you have to you know, work in all of those and build a, a, a larger coalition around rewarding work, but also increasing the skills of of workers and hopefully employers will come to the table at this point. They no haven't e for a long time, but maybe now is the time. No to easy go. answer. Another comment here. Okay, I'm Anke Grotlüschen from Hamburg University. I'm a professor for lifelong learning. Um, I would like to thank you, Danielle, especially for your presentation because I found it very sharp and clear. Um, and I um, realized that you mentioned a couple of countries that uh, perform a bit differently than others in terms of um, numeracy at work and um, gender issues with regard to STEM. Um, did I get it right that it has, there has been um, an accumulation of um, Poland, the Czech Republic, and uh, Slovakia? Because I'm, uh, I grew up uh, pretty close to the Berlin Wall, and um, there is an issue um, in gender equity, especially for um, the, the technical, uh, the, the academic professions. Let's say our Chancellor, Angela Merkel, is, um, holds a PhD in physics, not in liter literature or whatever, but in, in physics. And many women in uh, post-Soviet countries, or during the Soviet um, era, um, preferred academic careers in um, technical or what you say, what you call STEM areas than that they do, like as they do today. And we usually split the, uh, the, um, the, the subpopulation, we split it by generation and to, to grasp those who were socialized under the Soviet era mm -hmm. and were more likely to end up in STEM professions than those who grew up later and end up like the West, Western Germans in uh, the typical female professions. Very good. Daniel. Um, well, Any reaction? Thank you. That was very helpful. I mean, I think uh, also the, I sort of had a question for Danielle as well, which is um, her reaction or her suggestions for thinking about STEM occupations. Is it 
or, or is the, your research suggesting that we need to either broaden the definition of STEM or use something else in addition to STEM to identify um, the, the jobs that do have high numeracy focus? And then what would you say the policy implication of that might, might be? Um, right, so I mean, I think t on some level that might be a semantic distinction whether we call it STEM, whether we mm -hmm. call it something else, but I certainly think we need to broaden the definition of whatever that is to encompass these other occupations that are not necessarily these high level, high skill, white collar occupations, which is what much of the literature on STEM, or especially gender disparities in STEM, focuses on. It's the doctors, it's the physicists, right? But my paper shows that much of the action is really happening in these kind of Blue, more blue collar or uh, uh, careers that require lower levels right. of education. Um, so I just really wanted to kind of shift the research focus over mm -hmm. to that and say, hey, look what's happening here too, because this is really important. Very good. And a lot of people who are engaging in numeracy in their jobs are in these other types of professions. It's important to look at equity issues there too. Yeah.